we begin our service. The offering this evening will be given to the Christmas Fund of the United Church of Christ, which cares for active and retired clergy and lay employees of the church. Offerings should be placed in the offering box, which is, um, there are two of them, in the back of the church. Give generously and thank you. I welcome you this holy night to hear the story of the prophets, angels, and shepherds of a young woman, a carpenter, or a newborn child. We come to remember as the holy child is born once again in our hearts and in our lives. Our time of waiting ends this night as old dreams die and new dreams come to life. Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth as Christ the Lord is born in us as he was born so long ago. Bless us, Holy One, and fill us with wonder and mystery this holy night. Good evening. O oh, manger, straw strewn, cradled in the night, rough hewn, muzzle damp in space, where cattle feed, sparrows nest, and cloth snag on splintered wood. O oh, simple feeding trough for God's lowly beast, you are the first bearer of good news, first container of living water, bread of life. Come, clear out with a gust of father's breath and mother's trembling touch. Make room to behold the promise of God. And our opening hymn is 132, Joy to the World in the Black Funeral. Please stand up here. As we pray for our country, 
may we know peace. Gracious God, be with us this holy night. Amen.
60, 1 through 3. <clears throat> Thank you. I'll read this with me. Arise, Arise shine, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the people. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come into your light, and kings will strike the light of the God. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. Thanks be to God. Okay. I'm going to try to do a little number here.
As the story begins, the cast of characters is small. God and an angel, a woman and a man, later there will be an emperor, an innkeeper, many more angels, wise men, shepherds, and of course, a baby. The story begins with God, and that's the way it should be for all things, including you and me. We all begin and end in God. We all begin and end in love. The world was a dark, sad place. Once upon a time, God cried. Oh, once upon a time. That's the only way to begin with a timeless story. You might think it's the way to start a story for children. But I want you to remember this. We are all children. No matter how old we are, all brothers and sisters of Jesus, who was born in Bethlehem, once upon a time, and today. Once upon a time, God cried. God looked down on the earth that God had created and loved, and a tear formed in God's eye. God was sad because the world was sad. God saw that there was goodness and beauty and truth in the world, but it was all mixed up with evil and ugliness and lies. God's people thought God was angry with them. The world looked pretty dark. A great tear formed in God's eye, a great, bright, shining tear. God saw what the people needed. They needed light so that they could see that God was not angry with them, that God loved them. God called for Gabriel, the angel who was strong, bright, big, with holy light and wings. Gabriel could fly wherever God sent him. Gabriel was God's right hand angel. Gabriel flew to God and asked, what do you want? I have something important for you to do, Gabriel, said God. You can count on me, responded Gabriel, as he noticed the bright, shiny tear in the corner of God's eye. God, said Gabriel, have you been crying? Yes, Gabriel, replied God, and God's eyes filled with more shining tears. Then God leaned over and whispered something into Gabriel's ear, and Gabriel laughed. The kind of laugh that people laugh when they find out something unexpected and totally good is about to happen. You might say, that's not in the Bible, and of course you would be correct. But what does it matter? After all, God's tear and God's suffering over a hurting world and, God's, and Gabriel's laugh, his delight with the surprise God was planning for both Mary and the world, are these not true? So Gabriel, laughing, flapped his mighty wings and in a flash of blinding light was gone on his way to earth to a town called Nazareth to a young woman named Mary. Mary, who was full of life, Excited about the future, engaged to be married to the carpenter Joseph, Mary was making bread for the new day. Now that's not in the Bible either, but Gabriel had to visit sometime. In, his, in this story, Mary was kneading the bread dough when the angel appears. God is like that, breaking into the ordinary, coming at the least expected times, changing everything. After love breaks into the ordinary, nothing is ever quite the same again. Mary nearly knocked the bag of flour off the table. There was Gabriel in the corner of the room, his great wings moving just enough to keep him in the air, his light filling the room so brightly that Mary could hardly see. Greetings, favored one, Gabriel said with a hint of laughter in his voice. The Lord is with you. Mary was confused and scared at the same time, and, and who could blame her? She had never seen an angel before. And I suspect most of us have never seen an angel before. We go about our daily lives and nothing quite as extraordinary as Gabriel ever happens to us. Or does it? Many are the ways that God speaks to us. A loving presence that seems to be there just for you. We may not have the flash or glamour of a Gabriel, but the many ways in which God speaks to us are quite extraordinary and filled with surprise. That is, if we are open to being surprised. Gabriel knew that Mary was scared and he said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. Gabriel's voice was surprisingly soft and gentle, and Mary felt her fear fly away. She wanted to know what this visit was all about. Gabriel told her that she was going to have a baby, a son, and that she would name him Jesus. Well, that certainly surprised Mary. 
She knew how things happened and she didn't have a husband yet and asked Gabriel, how can this be? I don't have a husband. Gabriel couldn't hold the secret at her any longer and laughing, he told her, she wouldn't need a husband, at least not a human one. God was going to be her husband and Jesus was going to be holy and called the Son of God. He will be the light of the world and will save God's people from darkness and in him all the world will see love and will be loved. God's secret was out. God's secret was out. God isn't angry with us. God is hopelessly in love with us. And Mary laughed. When Mary heard the secret, her fear left her and disappeared. God was doing a wonderful thing, and God was going to do it through her. Mary looked up at Gabriel and said, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be me according to the, your word. Gabriel smiled, and in a flash, was gone. The room was back to normal, but nothing was really normal or would be normal ever again. According to the Bible, the Holy Spirit came upon Mary and the power of the Most High overshadowed her. So what does this mean exactly? We don't know. What we do know is that we enter, have entered into the world of mystery. The mysteries are meant to be entered into and lived into. Nine months passed, and Mary's tummy grew big with her baby growing inside her. She married Joseph. Gabriel had visited Joseph in a dream and let him in on God's secret. All his fears and doubts disappeared in the flesh of Gabriel's wings. Mary was fine. Yes, Mary was fine. She belonged to God, but was a gift to Joseph. Mary cared for Joseph, and he cared for her. The trip from Nazareth to Bethlehem was rough on Mary. Riding the donkey is not much fun when you were close to having a baby and not feeling well. The Roman emperor wanted to tax all the people of Israel, so he ordered all the people to return to hometowns where they could be counted and have their names put on the tax list. Joseph's family originally came from Bethlehem, so that's where they had to go. Mary repeated the name of the baby, Jesus, over and over. She felt like she was traveling wrapped in God's loving embrace. The name Jesus, you see, is a prayer. It is a prayer that expresses our deepest longing, all of our need, all of our hope for today and for tomorrow. They arrived in Bethlehem weary and tired. Joseph looked for a place to stay and found nothing. Mary felt a sudden pain, spasm of pain and knew that the time was near. God looked down and saw Mary. God felt both her pain and joy, for in the birth of a baby, there is plenty of both. A tear of happiness escaped from God's eye and fell towards the earth. As it fell, it became a brilliant star that grew brighter each minute until it came to rest over Bethlehem. In the star's light, Joseph saw a rough stable in the dark, silent streets of Bethlehem. He found fresh hay and a small manger to make a bed for the soon-to-be <coughs> baby. As Mary and Joseph looked up at the star in the night sky before entering, a shower of falling stars fell from heaven to earth. <coughs> it's not in the Bible either. But it's nonetheless true. God wept tears of happiness for the birth of Mary's child. In heaven, God heard the lusty, healthy, holy cry of a baby, and God smiled. God turned to Gabriel and said, it's time. Time, asked Gabriel. Yes, said God, time to tell the never-ending story. You, my trusty angel, shall be the first to tell it. Go quickly to the hill country outside of Bethlehem to the shepherds. Go and tell them the story. Gabriel laughed, and with a flash was gone. Before a shooting star could cross the night sky, there was Gabriel hovering over the hillside, scaring the devil out of the shepherds. Gabriel told them not to be afraid because he was bringing them great, good news of great joy, that a baby named Jesus was born this day in Bethlehem, who is the Savior, the Son of God. His light is the light of all people, and darkness will not overcome it. Gabriel told the shepherds that they would find the baby in a stable, lying in a manger. And suddenly, Gabriel was surrounded by more angels praising God. 
Glory to God and on earth peace to the people God loves. <clears throat> and the night sky was filled with shooting stars. The shepherds were amazed, shaken, surprised, frightened, and excited. One of the shepherds said, well, come on, let's go to Bethlehem right now and see if it really happened like we were told. So they left their sheep on the hillside and went to Bethlehem. They found Mary, Joseph, and the baby just as they were told. They stayed and shared what had happened with Mary and Joseph as they shared their bread and goat's milk. As the sun was coming up, the shepherds left, smiling and telling the people in the streets of Bethlehem the story. In heaven, God smiled. It had begun, the telling of the story, and it would continue until everyone was a child of light, until everyone was enfolded in God's love forever. And so it is. The light that grew from a tear in God's eye continues to get brighter and brighter with each telling of the Christmas story. The story of God's love is indeed a never-ending story, and because of this story, we now have a story of peace, which Bob will now bring to us. It happened during World War I. One. Um, come and listen, oh, and have a merry, merry Christmas and a happy new year. retelling in the 2005 movie, Yoé Noel. But not many have heard of the small Christmas Eve truce forced upon a handful of American and German soldiers by a godly German woman during the Battle of the Bulge in World War II. In 1973, Fritz Finken told the story of what young Fritz had witnessed as a child in his home on the German-Belgian border that miraculous Christmas Eve. It was Christmas Eve, and the last desperate German offensive of World War II raged around our tiny cabin. Suddenly, there was a knock at the door. When we heard the knock on our door that Christmas Eve in 44, neither Mother nor I had the slightest inkling of the quiet miracle that lay in before us. I was 12 years old then. Father had stayed at the cottage. I'm sorry, I was 12 years old, and we were living in a small cottage in the Huntington Forest near the German-Belgian border. Father had stayed at the cottage on hunting weekends before the war, when the Allied bombers hardly destroyed our hometown of Aiken. He sent us to live there. He had been ordered into the Civilian Defense Fire Guard in the border town of Matschau, four miles away. You'll be safe in the woods, he told us. Take care of Mother. Now you're the man of the family. But nine days before Christmas, Field Marshal von Rundstedt had launched the last desperate German offensive of the war. And now as I went to the door, the Battle of the Bulge was raging all around us. We heard the incessant booming of field guns. Planes roared continuously overnight. 
searchlights stabbed through the darkness. Thousands of Allied German soldiers were fighting and dying nearby. When that first knock came, Mother quickly blew out the candles. Then as I went to answer, the, the step ahead of me, she was a step ahead of me and pushed open the door. Outside, like phantoms against the snow-clad trees, stood two steel-helmeted men. One of them spoke to Mother in a language we did not understand, pointing to a third man lying in the snow. She realized that I did, before I did, that these were American soldiers, enemies. Mother stood silent, motionless, her hand on my shoulder. They were armed and could have forced their entrance. Yet they stood there and asked with their eyes. And the wounded man seemed more dead than alive. Mother said finally, come in. The soldiers carried their comrade inside, stretched him out on my bed. None of them understood German. Mother tried French, and one of the soldiers could converse in that language. As mother went to look after the wounded man, she said to me, the fingers of those two are numb. Take off their jackets and boots. Soon I was rubbing their hands to make them warm. We learned that the stocky, dark-haired fellow was Jim. His friend, tall and slender, was Robin. Harry, the wounded one, was now sleeping on my bed, his face as white as snow outside. They had lost their battalion and had, wa and had wandered in the forest for three days looking for the American lines, hiding all the time from the Germans. They hadn't shaved, but still, without their heavy coats, they, more, they looked more like boys. That was the way Mother began to treat them. Now, Mother said to them, go get Herman and bring six potatoes. I got to wonder who's Herman, right? <laughs> this was a serious departure from our pre-Christmas plans. Herman was a plump rooster, and he was named after poorly Herman Goring, Hitler's number two man for whom uh, my mother had disdain and little affection for. He had been fattened for weeks in the hope that Father would be home for Christmas. But soon, hours before, when it was obvious that Mother, I'm sorry, that Father would not make it, Mother had decided that Herman should live a few more days. <clears throat> this in case Father could get home for New Year's Eve. Now she had changed her mind again. Herman would serve an immediate pressing purpose. Poor Herman. <laughs> While Jim and I helped with the cooking, Robin took care of Harry. He had a bullet through his upper leg and it had almost bled to death. Mother tore a bed sheet into long strips for bandages. Soon the tempting smell of roast chicken permeated our room. I was setting the table when once again there came a knock at the door. Expecting to find more lost Americans, I opened the door without hesitation. There stood for soldiers, but they were wearing uniforms quite familiar to me after five years of war. They were Wehrmacht, Germans. I was paralyzed with fear. Although still a child, I knew the harsh law of sheltering enemy soldiers constituted high treason. We would be shot. Mother was frightened. Her face was white, but she stepped outside and said quietly, for luck, or not one. The soldiers wished her a Merry Christmas too. We have lost our regiment and would like to wait for daylight, explained the corporal. Can we rest here? Of course, Mother said, with calmness born of sheer panic. You can also have a fine, warm meal and eat till the pot is empty. The Germans smiled. And as they sniffed the aroma through the half-open door, but Mother Adley firm, added firmly, we have three other guests. You may not consider them friends. Now her voice was suddenly sterner than I'd ever heard before. This is Christmas Eve, and there will be no shooting here. Who's inside? The corporal demanded. Americana? Mother looked at each frost-chilled face. Listen, she said slowly. 
you could be my sons. And so could they in there. A boy with a gunshot wound fighting for his life and his two friends, lost like you, just as hungry and exhausted as you are. This one night, she turned to the corporal and raised her voice a little. This Christmas night, let us forget about killing. The corporal stared at her. There were two or three endless seconds of silence. Then mother put on an end to indecision. Enough talking, she ordered, and clapped her hands sharply. <clears throat> Please put your weapons here in the wood, wood pile and hurry up before the others eat the dinner. Dazed, the four soldiers placed their arms in the pile of firewood just outside the door. Three carbines, a light machine gun, and two bazookas. Meanwhile, Mother was speaking French rapidly to Jim. I can't imagine how that dinner conversation was. <laughs> he said something in English, and to my amazement, I saw the American boys, too, turn their weapons over to Mother. Now, as the Germans and Americans tensely rubbed elbows in the small room, Mother was really in her mouth. Never losing her smile, she tried to find a seat for everyone. We had only three chairs, but Mother's bed was big in it, and she placed two of the newcomers side by side with Jim and Robin. Despite the strained atmosphere, Mother went right on preparing dinner. I can see it now. <laughs> but Herman wasn't going, <laughs> despite the strained atmosphere, Mother went right on, and Herman wasn't going to grow any bigger, and now there were four more mouths to feed. Quick, she whispered to me, get more potatoes and some oats. These boys are hungry, and a starving man is an angry one. While foraging in the storage room, I heard Harry moan. When I returned, one of the Germans had put on his glasses to inspect the American's wounds. Do you belong to the medical corps, Mother asked? No. But I studied medicine at Heidelberg until a few months ago. Thanks to the cold, he told the Americans, in what sounded like fairly good English, Harry's wound hadn't become infected. He is, however, suffering from severe blood loss. What he needs is rest and nourishment. Relaxation was now beginning to replace suspicion. Even to me, all the soldiers looked very young as we sat there together. Hines and Willie, both from Cologne, were just 16. Their German corporal, at 23, was the oldest of them all. From his food bag, he drew out a bottle of wine, and Hines managed to find a loaf of rye bread. Mother cut it in small pieces to be served with the dinner, half with the wine. However, she put it away for the wounded boy. Then Mother said grace. I noticed that there were tears in her eyes as she said the old familiar words, Come, Harry Jesus, be our guest. And as I looked around the table, I saw tears too in the eyes of the battle-weary soldiers. They were boys again. Some from America, some from Germany, but they were all far from home. Just before midnight, Mother went to the doorstep and asked us to join her to look at the star of Bethlehem. We all stood outside, except Harry, who was sleeping. For all of us, during a moment of silence, looking at the brightest star in the heavens, the war was distant, almost forgotten. Our private armistice continued the next morning. Harry woke in the early hours and swallowed some broth that Mother had fed him. With the dawn, it was apparent that he was becoming much stronger. Mother now made him an invigorating drink from one egg. Where did the wine go? <laughs> <laughs> Afterwards, and the rest of the corporal's wine was put in the egg, and it was called eggnog. Afterwards, two poles in Mother's best tablecloth were fashioned into a stretcher for Harvey. For here, I'm sorry. The German corporal then advised Americans how to find their way back to their lines. Looking over Jim's map, the corporal pointed out a stream. Continue along this creek, and you will find the first army rebuilding its forces on its upper course. The medical student relayed the information in English. Why don't we head for Moscow? Jim had the student ask. 
Nine, Corporal said, we've retaken Moscow. Now mother gave him, gave them all back their weapons. Be careful, boy, she said, with a tear in her eye. I want you to get home someday where you belong. God bless you all. The German and American soldiers <coughs> shook hands. And we watched them disappear into opposite directions. When I returned inside, mother had brought out the old family Bible. I glanced over her shoulder. The book was open to the Christmas story, the birth and the manger, and how the wise men came from afar bearing their gifts. Her finger was tracing the last line from Matthew 2, verse 21. For they departed into their own country another way. As we sing Silent Night, number 134, um, we will light our candles.
in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.